Um, and please, uh, once again, help me in uh, welcoming Nupur, and thank you very much. Um, thanks, Daniel. I hope everybody can hear me well, um, and thanks for the lovely introduction. I'm so happy to be able to uh, support Joe Marley Research with the webinar here. Uh, as uh, Daniel already said, I am based out of Canada, so I'm operating at about a 14 hours minus time difference, so I'm the poor from the past, I guess, for the Australian people out there. Um, so my team and I here in Canada work with our customer base worldwide to make sure that they are successful with their SVR experiments when they use our instruments. So that's what I do here. Um, thank you so much for attending despite these uh, unprecedented circumstances. I really appreciate the time. So today we'll talk a little bit about uh, how SPR works and how SPR, SPR experimental design works. And then we'll dive into the trademark open SPR technology. And then towards the end of our seminar, uh, I'll talk about how open SPR has been used for accelerating COVID-19 research. So let's get started. So our mission in life at Nicoya is to improve, improve human life by helping scientists succeed. It is our goal in life to make uh, SPR technology accessible and affordable uh, to our researcher customer base worldwide so that they can work on their critical research that can improve human life. SPR has been the gold standard for measuring molecular interactions for almost two decades. Uh, SPR is a label-free uh, technique that is used to measure binding kinetics uh, for a wide variety of molecules, as we'll discuss shortly. So the first question is, when you are working with SPR, what type of data can you get with SPR? So let's assume you had a big library of molecules, maybe tens of hundreds of uh, molecules, and you only wanted to see if any of those biomolecules bind to the one target. So determining yes-no binding can be done with SPR. If you're trying to see how specific your binding interaction is, then SPR can help you with that as well. Um, to calculate the strength of the interaction, how strong is your interaction, um, and getting the numbers for your affinity or your equilibrium dissociation constant, SPR can help with that. And if you are going on a more granular analysis basis um, and you wanna figure out uh, uh, the on rate, which is how quickly do two biomolecules bind, and the off rate, how quickly do two biomolecules come apart. Um, SPR can help you with that as well. So this is all the types of data you can get with SPR. So some of the main benefits of SPR uh, would be the first off, no labeling is required, so no radioactive fluorescent labels. Your experiment can be done with samples in their wild format. Um, you need low sample volume. So anybody who's worked in the lab and potentially work with, let's for say, for example, protein purification or crude samples, you know how little sample we get out of these techniques. And it's very, very important to run assays with these, uh, with these samples and you wanna use low sample volumes. And SPR can help you there. Uh, you're able to get real-time binding data with SPR, so you don't have to wait a couple days, a couple weeks. As you are performing your experiment, you will get information about the binding of your system. And lastly, there's a flexibility in terms of application. So if you're working with protein, protein, protein antibody, protein small molecule, protein carbohydrates, uh, to name a few, you can work with all those applications using SPR. So a standard SPR or surface plasma and resonance assay would look like this, where you first off have a sensor chip. Uh, so this is the first component of your surface plasma and resonance experiment. Uh, the sensor chip consists of a glass substrate and uh, your sensor layer is coated on top of the glass substrate. And this is, uh, we, this is the piece which will help us with the detection of our biomolecules. Uh, an SPR experiment will have two biomolecules. The first one is the ligand, the biomolecule that's immobilized on the sensor. And the second biomolecule is the analyte, uh, the, uh, the biomolecule that's free flowing in your system. Uh, as a st standard SPR experiment, you will always have time on the X axis and response on the Y axis. And it generally consists of three phases. First off, you start with a bare sensor, maybe with a pre-functionalized chemistry. And uh, initially, since there's nothing bound to the sensor, you have a flat line response. 
as you introduce your ligand and bind your ligand to the sensor, you will start seeing an increase in the response and eventually saturation. The difference in the response from the start to the end of the signal tells you how much ligand is bound to your sensor. Once the ligand is bound to the sensor, you're ready to introduce your analyte. We generally recommend introducing three to five different concentrations of analyte to get your binding kinetic data. So as you introduce your analyte, you will see the signal go up uh, so, and this will uh, translate into the association phase. Once all the analyte has flown through the system and there's no more analyte and only buffer flowing on your ligand, you will see a dissociation and a decrease in signal, which will correspond to the dissociation phase. Um, as you perform experiments, there's several different kinds of SPR instruments that will exist in the market. Uh, for a traditional SPR instrument, this consists of a very, very thin film of gold. And as your laser light source shines uh, on this gold surface, uh, you will get uh, an, a standard angle of reflectance. Now, as you start uh, observing binding events uh, close to the sensor surface, this will lead to a change in the refractive index near the surface of the sensor and change in the reflectance angle. All this information will be detected by your detector and converted into a response. So this is what a sensorgram would look like and you would see an increase in the response as the binding signal increases. For Nikoya's open SPR technology, instead of using a thin film of gold, we use a nanostructured gold. We measure a change in the absorbance peak instead of the angle change for traditional SPR instruments. So the nanostructure gold over here will absorb light, creating a distinct absorbance peak for the gold. And as the binding events occur on the sensor, you will see a shift in this absorbance peak, which will be translated into a response. So with our nanostructured gold, we have greatly simplified the optics where we have a LED light source that will shine on your sensor and you have your detector on the other end. We continue to measure the change in the refractive index close to the sensor surface, but it's just a different way of measuring it with the gold. So some of the main advantages of the open SPR technology include simple and robust optics. Uh, due to the simplification of optics due to the nanostructure gold use, we are able to shrink the size of the instrument by a lot, so that's great. Uh, you get minimal background interference because you are working with localized surface plasma and resonance fields. Uh, you're able to get a high sensitivity uh, signal out of your um, instrument because you are working fairly close to the sensor surface. And with the robust spectral shift data, you are able to get real-time uh, binding information from your samples. Our Flagship instrument over here has two channels. Uh, the first one being the reference channel for testing for your non-specific binding interactions. And the second channel is your active channel that will be testing for the specific binding interactions. We have quite a few features automated for the system and we do offer the system with temperature control and a wide range of flow rates depending on the samples you're using. Overall, with the simplification of the optics, we have been able to make our instrument bench top. So it's the size of a household microwave. So you don't require a lot of space on your lab bench to actually work with the open SBR. The instrument is highly user-friendly. So you can be trained on the instrument in a few hours, anywhere from a summer intern to a graduate student, and they can incorporate the open SBR as a part of their workflow for their research. Um, as I mentioned before, you're able to get real-time binding kinetic data and you don't have to wait a couple days or a couple weeks to get the data. You can get it in real time. And the instrument is very robust and requires fairly low maintenance, which effectively reduces the downtime uh, with the, your research and with your work as you're doing experiments. Um, it's also important to note that with our current situation with COVID-19, there are lab closures that are affecting labs worldwide and travel restrictions that might uh, show up as issues when it comes to installation of equipment. Uh, with the Open SBR, we are able to offer a remote uh, product demonstration, product installation, onboarding, and also support to help our customers during these awkward times where they have to work in their labs and specifically for advancing COVID-19 research. So as I mentioned before, there's a wide range of applications that um, 
the open SPR can work with, and this makes it an excellent tool when you're working with COVID-19 related uh, problems. Either you're working with um, vaccine development or you're maybe working with diagnostic tool development, open SPR can be used uh, to understand the mechanisms that are surrounding the coronavirus and uh, getting a better understanding of these processes can help us develop vaccines and fight this problem with a billion people around, more than a billion people around the world being affected by this. So here's a very, very simplified version of how the coronavirus would work. Uh, so our coronavirus is um, basically uh, a positively charged RNA strand uh, encapsulated in a lipid um, uh, membrane. Uh, you've got your uh, spike protein receptor binding domain uh, in your coronavirus that will selectively go and bind to the ACE2 receptor in humans. And once this is bound, it will fuse into the cell and then the infection cycle will, will begin. So overall understanding how the spike protein receptor binding domain uh, will work and how it will transform can be very, very, is very, very essential and almost a key factor when you're looking at vaccine development or you're looking at diagnostic tool development, anywhere from stopping the virus from growing or even testing for anybody who may have immunity or contracted the virus. So what we've done over here is our team actually worked with a system where our ligand was the coronavirus spike protein receptor binding domain. And we immobilized that on our carboxyl sensor um, to begin with. As a proof of concept, we first have a monoclonal antibody from uh, rabbit that we introduce in just a running buffer uh, to test if we are able to specifically detect the signal for our monoclonal antibody with respect to our ligand. Uh, we show in this graph that with five analyte concentrations going from 150 nanomolar all the way down to 1.85 nanomolar uh, at a dilution factor of about three, we are able to detect highly specific and very, very strong binding signals for our monoclonal antibody against the uh, spike, pro spike protein receptor binding domain. We're able to observe that our KD is uh, in low nanomolar uh, range, uh, which actually indicates a very, very strong binding system. Going into a more realistic situation where you might have your antibody in a more physiological sample, maybe in serum, maybe in plasma, um, we actually um, tried to replicate uh, that idea beyond our proof of concept as a part two of this study, where uh, we spiked our uh, antibody in serum in about 50% serum. And we continue to see similar results uh, for our kinetic constants. So the binding mechanism hasn't changed and the open SPR is able to detect the highly specific antibody uh, against the spike protein and uh, show very, very strong binding. So again, our binding kinetic constants are not affected, uh, which makes open SPR an easy to use technique anywhere from your um, bu running buffer samples to serological samples. And lastly, the third part of this study was to understand if we can improve our limit of detection. So generally when you get your samples, maybe the biological samples, um, you would get them in serological media and you might have very, very low quantities of your um, monoclonal antibody. So we wanted to improve the limit of detection and see that with the open SPR. So what we've done here is that after our monoclonal rabbit antibody has been bound, we introduce a secondary amplification antibody, which will go bind to the FC region of the primary antibody, thereby helping increase the signal and increasing our limit of detection. So an example over here is where we have used our five and a half nanomolar um, sample of our primary antibody and once we introduce a secondary antibody we see almost a 300 percent increase in our signal which will make it a highly effective tool when you're working with very very low quantities of sample in a serological medium so overall our study has shown us that anywhere from proof of concept to working with complex media and also for improving limit of detection you can use open SPR through and through when you are trying to trying to study the coronavirus uh, and its mechanisms of binding, um, maybe for vaccine development and maybe uh, for diagnostic tool development.
So yeah, that's how we have been using OpenSBR and a few of our researchers as well, trying to combat the problem of the century, I suppose. And um, yeah, so that's how we can help at Nikoya. So let us know what we can do for you. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, opening the floor to any questions you guys may have. Thank you so much, Nipur. That was a great talk and very uh, enlightening on the uses of open SPR and, and specifically any kind of infectious disease work, but specifically COVID work, right? Yeah. So could be very beneficial in, in drug discovery and virus cell interactions and whatnot, right? Totally. So um, does anyone have any questions for Nupur? No, doesn't look like we have any questions. But if you have any additional questions, uh, please contact Nupur directly or uh, contact us at Jomar Life Research uh, at info at jlrresearch.com.au uh, with any additional questions and we'll be happy to answer them. Um, oh, one second, we have a question, Nupur. Yeah. Uh, from William, usually SPR is made bigger than you than the one you mentioned. In which space is for, where is space for temperature control? We actually have a Peltier on our system that helps with the temperature control. So it's a lot more smaller in size. So that's, we have integrated that with our sensors. Yep. Stage, okay. yeah. Are there... Yeah, so William says, I wonder how your machine precisely controls the temperature. So yeah, so as um, uh, we have a Peltier in the system, um, you, we are able to uh, see changes anywhere from four to 40 Celsius. So we're able uh, to see a 0 0.1 Celsius um, sort of shift that we can see with our Peltier system. So that's how we control the temperature of uh, the sensor state specifically where the interaction's happening. And if you do have an additional um, auto sampler robotic arm that can also control the system anywhere from four to 20 Celsius as well, depending on you storing the samples for a long time. Great, yeah. great, fantastic. Thanks, Nupur. Uh, Thanks. Last call for questions. Uh, I think that's, that's it. And like I said, we'll be posting this